Ukraine. 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 I've never thought I'd live to see the day when I would be debunking a video from the Gravel Institute just like a PragerU video. But I guess it was inevitable, with how many self-described leftists have shown their true nature when my country started needing help. So now I'm going to respond to the things I disagree with in their video. Health outcomes are abysmal. In 2019, the life expectancy of Ukrainian men was lower than in Syria, Iraq, and North Korea. Okay, so before we go into the real shit, why are they using the male life expectancy and not the average one? The answer is simple, it's because we have a huge gender gap and using only the male stat sounds worse. When you take the average life expectancy from the WHO data from the same year, we were actually ahead of these countries and three others. It's a minor point, but it does show how these guys use statistics to create a narrative. Some people turn to extremist politics, and that was partly because Ukrainian nationalism formed an opposition to the Soviet Union tended to have a strongly right-wing flavor. Why are they showing Lenin's statue being removed when talking about the right wing? Ukrainians have been subjugated by Russians for centuries. We only became part of the Soviet Union after the Red Army conquered us. So to us, these statues are kind of like what the Confederate officer statues are to black Americans. Removing them is undoing the glorification of unjust hierarchies and oppression, which is as left-wing as it gets. In 1991, we had 5,500 Lenin monuments, and as of 2015, only around 1,500 were left. And honestly, I'd say demolish them all. Fuck Lenin with his vanguard party bullshit, and fuck the USSR, under which my people were used as slaves and were forced to eat each other's flesh to survive famines. And fuck you if you still believe the USSR. USSR was good. In the 1930s and 40s, Bandera wanted Ukrainian independence from Poland and the Soviet Union. So when the Nazis invaded, Bandera allied with them. His followers massacred huge numbers of Poles and Jews. But in spite of this legacy, Bandera is still viewed as a hero in the west of Ukraine. Okay, let me clarify some things about Stepan Bandera. First of all, I acknowledge the fact that Bandera was a piece of shit anti-Semitic ultranationalistic Nazi collaborator. It is undeniable. Now, let's super quickly learn his history and point out where I disagree with the Gravel's portrayal. Bandera was born in western Ukraine and was radicalized against both Russians and Poles after living through the wars against Poland and Russia before he even turned 13. While he was studying and maturing, he was also influenced by the elaborate anti-Jewish discourse that was happening in the Eastern and Central Europe at the time. During his university studies, he joined the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, and in June 1933 he became regional head of OUN in western Ukraine. He turned the organization from expropriations towards punitive actions against the Polish officials who were directly responsible for anti-Ukrainian policies. He was arrested by the Polish authorities in 1934 and was in prison until the German invasion of Poland in 1939. Shortly after, OUN was split into OUNM, that stayed with the more moderate leader, and OUNB, that supported Bandera. Both of the OUN factions started working with the Nazi Germany. Bandera was desperately trying to get on Germany's good side, which even involved contributing to the Holocaust whenever it was viewed to be politically beneficial. And then, as the Nazi troops have actually arrived to Ukraine in June 1941, Bandera and his people declared an independent Ukrainian state, which has always been his goal. He expected the Nazi regime to recognize independent Ukraine as an Axis ally and was proven wrong, as he and other leading OUNB members were arrested by Gestapo shortly after. In January 1942 he was transferred into a concentration camp, but was held in a special barrack for high-profile political prisoners. And this, my friends, is where the grim dark plot became even more fucking grim. While Bandera was locked up, OUNB engaged in a bloody power struggle 
struggle against OUNM that resulted in tens of thousands of Ukrainians dead. Then they formed a paramilitary force, Ukrainian Insurgent Army, with the help of which they carried out an ethnic cleansing of Poles that resulted in 50 to 100,000 deaths, mostly women and children, many of whom were also tortured. You could argue that Bandera wasn't fully responsible for the massacres, since he was locked up during that and OUNB was actually led by Mykola Lebedy, who was the architect of these ethnic cleansings and with whom Bandera supposedly often disagreed. But it honestly doesn't matter. OUNB was his organization with operating principles that he helped cultivate. Plus he did trust Mykola Lebedy enough to have him as second in command. So fuck that Weasley apologia. The guy is definitely responsible. After Bandera was released from the camp in 1944, he supposedly refused to cooperate with Germans any longer. And after the war ended, he was reinstated as the leader of OUNB and continued armed resistance against Soviet Russia. In 1959, after years of hiding, he was finally tracked down and killed by a Soviet KGB agent in Munich. That's pretty much his story. Bandera was a devout Ukrainian nationalist leader, who was willing to do anything, even the most horrible atrocities, to come closer to the dream of Ukrainian independence, and still fucking failed. But the main thing I want you to understand about Bandera is that most Ukrainians only know him as an independence fighter and have no idea about any of this. Our education system has an unhealthy tendency of whitewashing our historical figures, and the same goes to our mainstream media, which I'm sure is not unique to my country. So when you are pointed at Ukrainians celebrating Bandera, they are probably doing it because of the independence element, not fascism or anti-Semitism. In 2010, Bandera was even named an official Hero of Ukraine. Yes, one month before President Yushchenko left office, he made Bandera Hero of Ukraine for, and I quote, defending national ideas and battling for an independent Ukrainian state. So yeah, not for killing Jews or seeking alliance with Hitler. But still, this decision was highly controversial. So unsurprisingly, his hero status was officially annulled one year after, which is good. I would say the fact that he only was hero of Ukraine for one year out of the 30 years of our country's existence is definitely worth mentioning. But it doesn't really fit the narrative that the Gravel Institute is pushing. So yeah, being fair and balanced is not on the menu. Fast forward to 2010, when Ukraine elected a relatively pro-Russian politician named Viktor Yanukovych as its president. What do you mean by relatively? Yanukovych was Putin's bitch. He was anti-NATO the entire time he was president. He was very indecisive when it came to European integration and was slowly dragging Ukraine towards the Russian sphere of influence. He even agreed to let the Russian Navy indefinitely stay in Ukrainian waters even though Ukraine has been a neutral country since independence. In November 2013, a week before flying to Vilnius Eastern Partnership Summit, this guy had the government suspend the preparations for signing the association agreement, which was the original reason for Yevromaidan, by the way. On the 26th of November, the government admitted that Russia asked it to delay, and that same day, Putin defended the Ukrainian government's decision and said the EU deal was bad for Russia's security interests. Then, after a week of protests, at the actual summit Yanukovych straight up refused to sign the association agreement, saying he would need more money, plus Russia as a third party in negotiations. What other evidence do you need about this guy's allegiances? Also, it's not like we removed Yanukovych just because he was Putin's tier 3 sub. The guy was mega corrupt. He and his businessman friends known as the Yanukovych family literally ruled over Ukraine like mafia. He was the world's third most expensive president. The guy was literally shitting into a golden toilet in his 75 million dollar mansion. He was also known for 1984 ing journalists and historians, plus jailed his political opponents. Overall, if you want my honest assessment as a Ukrainian who lived under this guy, Yanukovych is a subhuman piece of shit, who should be thrown into prison to never see the light of day for everything he has done to my country. 
and the fact that this guy is currently enjoying a life of luxury in Russia should incriminate every Russian politician who allowed him in. Seriously, when this motherfucker fled from justice to Russia, he simply bought a different mansion, now for 52 million, and fucking settled in. Amazing. Groups like the quote, right sector, the ultra-nationalist Svoboda party, originally called the Social National Party of Ukraine, try turning those words around, acted as a small but influential organized minority within the protests. And those extremists played an important role in exacerbating the protests by encouraging violence and more radical rhetoric. Or maybe the protests were actually exacerbated by the government's crackdown during the night of the 30th of November, when special police units attacked protesters and civilian bystanders, chasing unarmed people several hundreds of meters and proceeding to beat them with batons and feet. 79 people were injured. Or maybe it was the assault on protesters on the night of the 11th of December, featuring 4,000 special force troops and 3 to 4,000 mercenary thugs that Yanukovych used for intimidation, provocation and attacks on both protesters and the media where the police were too restricted by law. Or maybe it was the implementation of anti-protest laws in January, resulting in street riots against which police used rubber bullets, water cannons in freezing temperatures, stun grenades and occasionally live ammunition, resulting in at least 1,177 injured and 4 dead, plus 21 missing. In one reported incident, riot police detained two protesters, stripped them naked, doused them in water, and made them run back to Maidan on foot in the sub-freezing temperatures, while they were fired upon with rubber bullets. Maybe these were the reasons behind the escalations? No, 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 the Gravel Institute says it was because of the far right. It is very important to paint a picture in which the Yanukovych government are innocent victims and the protesters are led by far-right fascist super Nazis. Thank you guys. There are allegations that the sniper attack was actually orchestrated by the right sector and its co-conspirators. Ah, allegations. And would you look at that. The source is Stephen Cohen, famous Putin apologist and conspiracy theorist. You know, I'm normally a staunch anti-death guy, but people like Stephen Cohen almost make me appreciate human mortality. This guy was constantly white knighting Putin in front of the American public, blamed the Ukraine crisis on the United States, denied evidence that pro-Russia militants shot down Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, instead suggesting it was done by Ukrainians, just like Russia did, and also wrote numerous articles and did media appearances shitting on Ukraine's revolutionaries and defending Russian actions. According to Think Progress, Cohen's writings for The Nation helped lead to staffers at The Nation openly revolting against the magazine's pro-Russian tilt. Oh, and I almost forgot. He also regularly appeared on Russia Today, a famous English-language Kremlin-funded propaganda outlet. Nice. Can someone please tell the Gruvel Institute you don't have to be pro-Russia to criticize America? Thank you. And the U.S. recognized interim government that replaced him had a significant far-right faction. The deputy prime minister, the minister of defense, and others were all from that far-right party, Svoboda. And this led to backlash in the East, because Eastern Ukrainians were horrified at what they saw as a far-right seizure of power. So when she's saying the government had a significant far-right faction, I get it, significant is a relative term. But, first of all, regarding this spooky Svoboda party, at the time of the 2014 revolution, it was the first time ever that Svoboda was represented in Ukrainian government, and it only had 42 out of 450 people there. In the next parliament elected that same year, their parliament share dropped to only 6 people, and now, since 2019, it's only one fucking person. Fell off plus ratio, if I may. Now, let's look at these four guys who the Gruvel Institute chose as the scary far-right people who led to the backlash in the East. Who's the scariest guy? Probably the Minister of Defense, right? Oh, would you look at that. He was in office for a grand total of 26 days. And we've had five more ministers after him, all independents. Nice. But hey, it's not like this is worth mentioning, right, Gravel Institute? 
Next scariest dude should be deputy prime minister, right? Well, only until you look into the Ukrainian governmental hierarchy. Basically, this dude was one of the two dudes who were all under the first prime minister who himself was under the prime minister. This guy was barely in the fucking government and he was there for only 10 months. As for the other two guys, they also left office that same year and faded into obscurity, just like their spooky party. So yeah, nice framing, Gravel I. Energized by the annexation and supported by Russian armed and military personnel, the anti-government protests became a full-blown secessionist movement. Eastern provinces like Donetsk and Luhansk held separatist referendums and declared independence. Look, people, calling those referendums is an insult to democracy. Both of them were held after the government institutions were taken over by pro-Russian militants who declared the establishment of both republics. And both of those pseudo-referendums were fraudulent through and through. Let's take the Donetsk case as an example. For starters, many Ukrainian activists and opponents of secession have fled the region due to the campaign of intimidation, beatings and hostage taking by the insurgents, leaving the so-called referendum to take place without most of the opposing voices. According to Human Rights Watch, at least 24 people were being held by the insurgents in the Donetsk region at the time. Zero international organizations were present to supervise, since no one invited anyone. Even Russia didn't send their representatives. Only around 470 journalists were present to observe the farce. As such, CNN reported seeing some people vote more than once at ballot boxes. BBC filmed a woman putting two ballot papers into the same box. And reporters with the German newspaper Bild followed a man who, according to them, voted eight times. And when asked if he even lived in Donetsk, he answered no, which the polling officials said was not a problem. When interviewing voters at a polling station, Vice News crew were detained for three hours by masked men with assault rifles who demanded their memory cards. That aside, the ballots used had no protective features to prevent mass duplication and were printed with standard commercial printers. The Donetsk Regional Education Superintendent informed reporters that they were forced under threat of death to organize polling stations in the schools. Two official electoral commissioners were kidnapped by separatists prior to the vote. A good number of ballots have also been pre-filled before the actual referendum took place. For example, on May 10, 2014, Ukrainian army forces captured a group of armed separatists who were carrying over a hundred thousand ballots pre-filled in favor of succession, even though the actual voters haven't even seen the ballots before May 11th. As a cherry on top, DPR officials have stated that the voter turnout was 74.87%. But these numbers are hardly credible, since with the stated voter turnout and number of polling stations in, for example, Donetsk, each voter would have only had around 8 seconds to vote. Alternatively, according to the Ukrainian Ministry of Internal Affairs, not more than 32% of people actually voted in the Donetsk referendum, which is a much more realistic number. There are many more violations, but I think you get it. Pretty much the same shit was happening in the Lugansk region. They even copied the voter turnout number. My point is, anyone who unironically calls these referendums and implies they are anything more than just fabricated post hoc justifications for the existing puppet regimes, anyone like that is a great asset for the Russian imperialist government, who are at the moment laboriously manufacturing consent for the invasions. Russia appreciates your service, useful idiots. The new government branded these rebellions as quote, terrorist actions. We didn't brand them as terrorists, we accurately recognized them as terrorists. Eastern separatists are not some glorious Antifa warriors maligned by the state. For fuck's sake, never mind the kidnappings, torture, summary executions and shellings of Ukraine-controlled cities, in 2014 these guys shot down a civilian plane killing 298 people. Show me a person who still believes that's not terrorism. And I'll show you a numbskull Russian simp whose parents I inter Forced. But Azov's neo-Nazism turned out not to be such a huge concern to the Ukrainian government. Because in 2014, a guy named Arsen Avakov became interior minister in charge of police and security. And Avakov had been a longtime patron of the neo-Nazi gangs. 
And when he was a regional governor, he used them as enforcers. So when he became interior minister, Avakov had the Azov Battalion incorporated into Ukraine's National Guard. Look, I know that Avakov is a piece of shit. He was hated and frequently protested by the people. But this framing is super dishonest. First of all, Avakov didn't just specifically bring Azov into the Ukrainian army. All volunteer battalions were legalized and brought into the army and or police forces to make sure they actually responded to some authority and properly cooperated with each other. So that was a nice obfuscation. Second of all, I think it is worth mentioning that Avakov resigned from his position and left the Ukrainian government in July of last year and has since been replaced by a proper minister with experience and actual legal education and who wasn't a fucking businessman for once. So that's nice. Ukraine is the only country to have a neo-Nazi formation in its military. No, not really. First of all, all militaries have far-right elements in them. For example, here's an interesting article titled Neo-Nazi Networks Exposed Across United States Military with a neat photo of US snipers posing in front of a Nazi SS flag in 2012. It's a good read. Secondly, do you recognize this guy with his Nazi-themed tattoos? His name is Dmitry Valerievich Utkin. He's a former Special Forces officer in GRU, which is a Russian CIA equivalent. He is one of the founders and leader of the Wagner Group, named after his GRU call sign Wagner, and infamous for their involvement in atrocities in Ukraine, Syria, Central Africa and other countries, plus for the killing of journalists who tried to investigate them. Wagner PMCs have received state awards in the form of military decorations and certificates, signed by Russian President Vladimir Putin. Here's a photo of Putin posing with Dmitry Utkin and his comrades in 2016, during their visit to Kremlin celebrating the Day of Heroes of Fatherland. Utkin himself is a recipient of not one, but four orders of courage. And many credible sources, including Russian ones, argue that the private military company Wagner is actually a disguised branch of the Russian Ministry of Defense that ultimately reports to the Russian government and only exists in a pseudo-private status to ensure plausible deniability and public secrecy. I am very inclined to trust that, especially considering that private military companies are not even legally allowed in Russia. So that was Wagner Group. Here's a photo taken in Donbass of far-right pro-Russian fighters from recon and assault group Rusich with neo-Nazi symbols on their helmets. Oh, but Daniel, that's actually just a Slavic symbol called Kolovrat. So the guys cannot be Nazis. Well, yeah, that is Kolovrat, widely recognized as a Slavic swastika. I can also play that game. Look, it's the Azov Battalion emblem. What do you mean there's a huge wharf angle in the middle? That's just a combination of letters I and N, which stands for idea of nation. These guys just love their country. Shut the fuck up. And the last dishonorable mention goes to the volunteers from the Russian National Unity, an explicit neo-Nazi political party and paramilitary, fighting on the separatist side in Donbass. Look at that giant red swastika. Mwah. Chef's kiss. But hey, Gravel Institute said only Ukraine has neo-Nazi formations, so when the formation is unofficial, it's A-OK. -okay. Plus, to be completely fair and balanced, while the Azov people are mostly neo-Nazis, they're always denying it, and only a small minority of people in Ukraine actually knows about their leanings. Most people know them from TV as heroes who repelled the separatists from Mariupol and played a crucial role in Ukraine not losing even more territories to Russia in 2014. And this is pretty much where the discourse ends, so hopefully we can get to peace sooner and start looking into them. At which point, I assure you, the heads will start rolling, metaphorically speaking. The research group Bellingcat showed that Azov was receiving access to American grenade launchers. A Daily Beast investigation showed that US trainers were unable to prevent aid from reaching neo-Nazis. And Azov itself posted a video of the unit welcoming representatives from NATO. Well, this is your fuck up, not ours. You've definitely had enough leverage to get Ukraine to agree these weapons will never get into the hands of Azov volunteers. Maybe you could have even started the process of their separation from the government forces. But all you did was use the battalion as a boogeyman for your political needs. That's on you, America. Ukraine is still mired in a war on its territory, and the Russian government likes to use Ukrainian nationalists in its propaganda. 
Which is exactly what you're doing right now, though maybe not as overtly. I'm just asking questions, bro. I'm just trying to explore the issue while citing pro-Russian sources like Stephen Cohen and The Nation and throwing around barely altered talking points from Russia today. Good one, Crowell. I appreciate your work. Part of its practice of painting all Ukrainians as Nazis. Of course, those claims aren't really true. I'm sorry, aren't really true? So them saying all of my people are Nazis is only kinda true? Whoever fucking wrote this, my friend. Genuine question. Can you please remove your tongue off of Putin's balls? I think that might be interfering with your judgment. Just saying. During the protests, American Senator John McCain made a public appearance with a leader of the far-right Svoboda party. This guy. He had previously been kicked out of Ukraine's parliament for extreme anti-Semitism. And here's that same guy meeting with then Vice President Joe Biden. Tjahnebok hasn't been in the actual government since the end of 2014. And like I said before, his party is pretty much dead. So since the 2014 uprising, Ukraine's far right has become increasingly powerful. Azov veterans have been given high positions in the security services. In 2016, Andriy Perubi, pictured here when he was leading a neo-Nazi party in the 90s, became Speaker of the Ukrainian Parliament, even as he continued to offer praise for Adolf Hitler. Andriy Parubi was a speaker when Petro Poroshenko was pandering to nationalists. He stopped being the speaker almost three years ago after our current president got elected. President who is a Russian-speaking Jew, by the way. For your information, Parubi is currently a regular parliament deputy, one of 450. And he works under Petro Poroshenko, who opposes our current president and tries his best to smear him every step of the way, just because he lost the election to him and he He's a fucking baby about it. So if you hate Parubi, good, go ahead and support Zelensky and his progressive liberal party. The new Ukrainian government even made it a criminal offense to deny Bandera's heroism. Criminal offense to deny Bandera's heroism? That's not entirely true, to say the least. In 2015, Poroshenko passed four laws. First one denouncing Nazis and Soviets and banning the propaganda of their symbols. Second one allowing access to the archives of the repressive institutions of the former USSR. Third one on the immortalization of the victory over Nazism in World War II. And fourth one, the one in question, was on the legal status and commemoration of independence fighters. In that law, Poroshenko listed around a hundred different historical formations, gave them veteran status and their families' social benefits, stated that those who would publicly regard them with contempt will be liable under the law, not specifying in which way, and that public denial of the lawfulness of the struggle for Ukrainian independence is vaguely illegal. I've never heard about a single instance of people getting prosecuted for that. But if you have that information, please post it in the comments. Not gonna lie, the law is very cringe. Just like the former president who passed it to pander to his cringe lord nationalist base. But still, now that you've heard what it really is, I hope you will agree that it's a far cry from a law that specifically makes it a criminal offense to deny Bandera's heroism. And once again, the source is an article that just completely shits all over Ukraine, implying we're all Nazis and fascists, and the Gravel Institute people are uncritically citing it on their huge platform. Nice. Moving on to the next smear. And in 2021, the United States and Ukraine were the only two countries to vote against a UN resolution condemning the glorification of Nazism. So the context is that this resolution has been introduced by Russia to basically legitimize their invasion of Ukraine, painting us as Nazi sympathizers. It was originally introduced in like 2005 to condemn Ukraine and Baltic states for desecrating Soviet war memorials, which the Russians refer to as memorials to those who fought Nazism. But the Ukrainians and Baltic people generally view as monuments to our occupiers. If you're doubting me about the bill's purpose, please ask yourself. Why did almost every European nation abstain, functionally opposing it, if this was such a benign anti-Nazi bill? 
And then look at the government supporting it. Russia, a country that likes to invade its neighbors and fund far-right militias. China, that is currently doing a Uyghur genocide in Xinjiang. Saudi Arabia, that is war criming the shit out of civilians in Yemen. And Belarus, that has been ruled by a single dictator for over 27 years, whose favorite methods of dealing with protests is making the protesters and journalists disappear. Oh hey, North Korea is apparently with them too. How virtuous of them. Unsurprisingly, the Gravel Institute is using the same wording as Russia Today in their article about this, featuring yet another picture of Azov Battalion, by the way. I can only commend their diligence in manufacturing consent for further conquest, especially in light of Russia's recent invasion of Donbass. Once again, thanks for all the nuance, Gravel Institute. Kremlin should honestly start paying your staff a second salary. If you want more detail, I will link a political article from when the same vote happened in November 2014 and Russia has already invaded us. Attacks against Roma and gay people go unpunished. No, they do. While the police are not successful every time, people do get punished. But at this point, I should just ignore this allegation, since the source is yet another glorified blog post by Russia Today. Russia is a country that has effectively banned all public expressions of queerness, bans LGBT websites, has constitutionally banned same-sex marriages in fucking 2020, and has a republic in it where, after you get caught having gay sex a third time, you are executed. When a country like that dares to criticize another country's treatment of gays, that's rich. Really rich. I wish I could spit in the face of the person who wrote that article. Anyway, this is not about me. Moving on. A 2018 report found that Ukraine had more incidents of anti-Semitic hate crimes than all other post-Soviet republics combined. Not a 2018 report, it's a 2017 report, which is four years out of date. Why are you looking at the report that is four years old? Why not look at the report from 2021, in which Ukraine is no longer considered a problem? But of course, I know why, and I'm not repeating myself, since that would be infantilizing towards my audience. So that's the story of how the far right helped cause the country to fracture. But it's also a story about America how America's support helped legitimize the far right and allowed it to build influence. And that's a pattern you see over and over in American foreign policy. Getting involved in places that we don't really understand and supporting groups, lesser evils, that we think serve our interests. And then being surprised when the blowback hits us in the face. I completely reject the idea that Ukraine is a lesser evil. Ukraine is a great country that is currently trying its best, even though it does have its problems and could use some help and guidance from the established nations. Russia is an authoritarian oligarchy that treats its citizens as borderline serfs, violates human rights on a daily basis, and has already been in 13 different wars since it was established. It is an evil imperialist force that should be stopped before it swallows all its neighbors and gets to decide if it wants to go further. In conclusion, I'm fucking baffled by this video. It's hard to put into words how tired I am as a Ukrainian of being backstabbed by my supposed leftist comrades, while my country year after year struggles to defend against a far-right imperialist force. I get it, we all want to bash some fash, whether it's on the streets or online, but can we please do it without being obscenely dishonest and not in a way that enables imperialism of a rogue state? That would be awesome. At the same time though, this weird discourse helped me filter out the people whose leftism only amounts to saying America bad to the sounds of people clapping and calling them geniuses. Yes, I'm talking about you, Hassan Biker, you stupid fucking piece of shit. Go buy yourself another Porsche from the donations you received while justifying Russian conquest in my country. That will definitely show those capitalists. And on the other hand, huge thanks to Wash, Adam Something and all the people who expressed support or pushed against the Russia simping dumb fucks. And I appreciate you watching my video as well. But if you disagree with something here and want to write a comment about it, please make sure to at least look it up on Wikipedia first. Though I will be linking all the sources I can in the description, so you should check there as well. See ya!